All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the eighth and final preclinical med revision lecture on reproductive medicine. Uh, I hope that you're not feeling too stressed with regards to kind of end of year assessments. Um, just wanted to say thank you to uh, Dr. Victor Lin, our, our, our director, as well as uh, our vice president, Cherry Shi, for letting me adapt and use these slides for the purpose of today's presentation. I'd like to acknowledge to traditional owners of the lands, the Rwandra people of the Kulin Nations, and also acknowledge that the uh, land has never been ceded and this will always be and always will remain Aboriginal land. And I'd like to acknowledge any um, elders, past, present, emerging, those that may be attending or watching this lecture later. Um, and Furthermore, I'd like to thank the traditional owners of lands for taking care of Australia and enabling it to be a place where I and other international medicines can pursue our dreams. The funds raised by the lecture series will be going towards the Asylum Seeker Resource Center. And as a housekeeping, just a reminder everyone, the slides will be recorded later. So if you do need to like peace out early, I'm not gonna be too offended because I know like it is that time of year. Um, but anyways, yeah, just got any questions, comments, or concerns, just pop in the chat or ask away. So just going over some relevant anatomy. So the intact bony pelvis comprises of two hip bones held together with the sacrum and caustic posteriorly. And posterior laterally, there are a pair of synovial joints called the sacroiliac joints. And in the midline anteriorly, there's a secondary cartilaginous joint known as the pubic symphysis. The hip bone is made of three fused bones, the, uh, the, the pubis, the ischium, and the, uh, the ilium. And they all form to fuse to form the acetabulum where the head of the femur will kind of articulate with, as well as the obturator foramen, which is that cavity there. The ilium itself is made up of the iliac crest superiorly, from which extends from the anterior superior iliac spine to the posterior superior iliac spine. And the ilium has three surfaces, uh, the gluteal surface, um, the iliac fossa, and the sacral surface. The pubis is made up of its own pubic body and pubic crest uh, on top, and two rami, or kind of sheet-like um, projections, the superior pubic ramus and inferior pubic ramus. And when you move laterally on the pubic crest, you'll find that the pubic crest ends up into a bump called the uh, pubic uh, tubercle. And the body of each pubic bone articulates in the midline at the pubic symphysis. The superior surface of the pubis, the pubic crest and tubercle, is continuous with the pectineal line. And the reflection of the inguinal ligament is called the lacunar ligament, and which comes inwards from the medial part of the inguinal ligament and goes onto the pectineal line of the pubis. The ischium is made up of a body and a single ramus, and the ischial ramus itself fuses with the inferior pubic ramus. The ischial ramus ends posteriorly in a chunk of bone called the ischial tuberosity, which gives rise to the hamstring muscles. And the ischial tuberosity ends posteriorly in a bump called the ischial spine. And the spine itself divides into the greater sciatic notch between the PIIS and the ischial spine above from the lesser sciatic notch, which is itself located between the ischial spine and the ischial tuberosity below. And as I said earlier, the acetabulum is the sort of the femoral articulation point as part of the socket of the hip joint. So if you were to translate pelvis, it means basin, and therefore the, the brim of the basin, in this case, is known as the, well, the, the pelvic brim. The pelvic inlet is a planar surface that separates the abdominal cavity above from the pelvic cavity below, or the false pelvis, or greater pelvis, above from the true pelvis, or lesser pelvis. The boundary of the pelvic inlet is the pelvic brim itself, as mentioned earlier. Starting in the front, the pelvic brim consists of the pubic crest in purple, um, the pectineal line of the pubis uh, in blue, uh, and the arcuate line of the ilium in red, and the margin of the sacra isla in green. 
and posteriorly the sacral promontory in yellow. The pubic crest, pectin pubis, and arcuate line together form the linea terminalis, or end of the line if you want to translate that. Iliac crest and the iliac fossa project above the pelvic brim. The iliac crest and iliac fossa constitute the false pelvis, also known as the greater pelvis as mentioned earlier. Everything inferior to the pelvic brim is known as the true pelvis. The line delineating the false pelvis above from the true pelvis is known as the iliopectineal line, which is just a continuation of the pectineal line. The false pelvis is regarded as part of the posterior abdomen, viscera, and really has nothing to do with the pelvic viscera. The true pelvis includes the sacrum and the cossacks. Inside the true pelvis, we have the pelvic wall and floor, the pelvic viscera, the perineum, which is situated below the pelvic floor, uh, and the true pelvis sits between the pelvic inlet and pelvic outlet. If you were to consider the, the head of the fetus, which needs to traverse the pelvis, the fetal head itself has to get in through the pelvic inlet and get out through the pelvic outlet. The sticking point for the fetal head is the plane of least dimensions, which is essentially the narrowest part of the pelvis. The plane of least dimensions is neither the pelvic inlet nor the pelvic outlet, but rather it is extension from the S4 posteriorly uh, through the ischial spine and to the base of the pubic bone anteriorly. During childbirth, the fetal head rotates and flexes to present the nearest part to the plane of least dimensions. Here we're looking at the ligaments of the pelvis and the joints of the pelvis itself comprise of a pair of synovial joints called the sacroiliac joints. Laterally, the secondary cartilaginous joint called the pubic symphysis along the midline as alluded to earlier. The sacroiliac joint, as I mentioned, is a synovial joint. The articular surface is ear-shaped, and so is often the auricular surface. There is an auricular surface on the posterior part of the sacra isla, and there is an auricular surface on the ilium, uh, I-L-I-U-M, not to be confused with you know, the I-L-E-U-M in the small intestines. The auricular surface of the sacrum and the auricular surface of the ilium come together to form the sacroiliac joint. The sacroiliac joint itself is supported by, well, the sacroiliac ligaments. The sacroiliac ligaments attach directly to the sacrum and the ileum. And if you were given the sacroiliac joint and were told to make it as tough and strong as you could, you would put the ligaments in front to absolutely smother the anterior part of the capsule or the anterior sacroiliac ligament, as well as put ligaments behind the absolutely smoother part uh, to absolutely smother the posterior part of the capsule as well, which is the posterior sacroiliac ligament, and then put ligaments between the sacrum and ileum, which would make the interosseous sacroiliac ligament. The interosseous ligament tightens as the sacrum rotates and absolutely locks the joint. The ligament is said to be the strongest ligament in the body, the interosseous sacroiliac ligament. The sacroiliac joint is also supported by three accessory ligaments. It's not just the sacroiliac ligaments that stabilize the sacroiliac joint. And these are the iliolumbar, the sacrotuberous, and the sacrospinous ligaments. The notch above the ischial spine is also known as the greater sciatic notch. The notch below is obviously the lesser sciatic notch. The sacrotuberous ligament and the sacrospinous ligament convert the greater sciatic notch into the greater sciatic foramen. And by extension, the lesser sciatic notch will become the lesser, sci lesser sciatic foramen. The obturator foramen can also be seen in this image here. Uh, the obturator foramen leaves a small obturator canal superior anteriorly. In total, therefore, there are three exit points for the pelvis, the obturator canal, the greater sciatic foramen, and the lesser sciatic foramen. Here we are looking at the muscles within the, the pelvis and notice the, the views and what they are sort of highlight within the female pelvis. Uh, 
Three major muscles are associated with the bony structures of the pelvis. The obturator internus, which forms the lateral wall of the pelvis and attaches to the obturator membrane and bony margins of the obturator foramen. The obturator internus also extends a little bit onto the posterior superior surface of the lateral wall. The obturator canal is shown anterior superiorly and is not covered by the internus muscle here. The fibers of the obturator internus converge on the lesser sciatic foramen. Pick up a pair of little muscles known as the superior and inferior gemellus muscles or the gemelli muscles, which emerge into the gluteal region and heads onto the medial edge of the greater trochanter. The piriformis forms the posterior wall of the pelvis. Uh, and the piriformis arises from the anterior surface at the middle three pieces of the sacrum bone and the adjacent lateral mass. The piriformis exits via the greater sciatic foramen and emerges into the gluteal region as well. The piriformis is also a great anatomical landmark in the gluteal region for organizing the neurovascular bundle located there. Um, the levator ani, um, which forms also the floor of the pelvis or pelvic floor or pelvic diaphragm, is essentially considered to be a hammock of sorts. It is slung from one wall to the other and slopes down a little bit within the middle. It has a continuous origin along each of the lateral walls of the pelvis. Fibers of the levator ani traveled um, inferiorly towards the midline and interdigitate in the midline raphi called the anocoxygeal raphi, which extends from the tip of the coccyx to the anorectal um, junction. The line of attachment starts anteriorly on the internal aspect of the pubic bone adjacent to the pubic symphysis and runs across the obturator internus and ends at the ischial spine. Half of the obturator internus is above the line of attachment and the other half below the line of attachment. And the pelvis is the region above the pelvic floor. The perineum is the region below the pelvic floor and between the pelvic floor as well as the skin. As a result, the top half of the obturator internus will actually be in the pelvis, while the inferior half would be in the perineum. The lower half of the obturator internus also helps to form, as I said, the lateral walls of the perineum. And now let's focus on the lev levator ani, which is the functional bit of the pelvic floor. As I said earlier, it's a muscular diaphragm that divides the thorax and the abdomen. Uh, the, sorry, I'm sorry, uh, I meant to say just that there is a diaphragm that separates the thorax from the abdomen. Um, and the levator ani is the diaphragm that separates the pelvis and perineum. The abdominal pelvic cavity is continuous, is a continuous cavity in which there is no muscular diaphragm dividing the abdomen and pelvis. The levator ani can be divided into two parts, the pubococcygeus and the iliococcygeus. The pubococcygeus arises from the internal aspect of the pubic bone and the first part of the internal aspect of the obturator internus. Most of the pubococcygeus or the pubococcygeus proper heads back and inserts into the anococcygeal median raphe. However, there are a couple of special parts of the pubococcygeus that form that sling around the midline viscera. Uh, and uh, it forms that sling specifically around the anorectal junction known as, and this sling is known as the pubal rectalis. And it creates an angulation of the rectum on the anal canal. The angulation itself is known as the anorectal angle. And it is the important for uh, formation of the fecal, uh, for enabling uh, fecal continence and just controlling your bowel motions a little bit. The part of the pubic coccygeus that forms the sling instead around uh, the lateral aspects of the prostate or the vagina in males and females respectively 
is the pubo-prostaticus or pubo-vaginalis in males and females, respectively. Now, going on to the second muscle is the iliococcygeus. Um, uh, this muscle, it, it, it does not arise from another muscle, uh, whereas the obturator internus has a fascia overlying called the obturator fascis. The iliococcygeus arises instead from a linear thickening in the obturator fascia. There is a definite demarcation between the pubococcygeus and the iliococcygeus. The iliococcygeus underlaps the pubococcygeus and inserts into the pubococcygeal raphe inferior to the pubococcygeus. So first we have the fibers slinging around the prostate and the vagina in males and females respectively. And next we have the slinging fibers around the anal rectal junction. Next we have the actual proper aspect of the pubococcygeus which inserts into the anocoxygeal raphe. And finally, uh, the second part, the iliococcygeus, it underlaps the pubococcygeus and inserts into the pubococcygeal raphe beneath the pubococcygeus. And remember that the, the piriformis, the muscle described earlier, arises from the middle three bits of the sacrum and disappears through the greater sciatic foramen. There's a triangular muscle called the piriformis also known as the coccygeus or ischial coccygeus. This muscle together with the levator ani form the pelvic floor. And the coccygeus goes from the ischial spine to the sacrum and simply constitutes a few muscle fibers on the sacrospinous ligament. Uh, while in, if you come from like a veterinary background, this is this ligament is important in dogs and cats so that they can wag their tails. It's probably not as functional to us, perhaps during our ape ancestors back in the day, but definitely not for us now. So now let's talk about the various anatomical pouches. There's a fascia lining the pelvic wall, which is a direct continuation of fascia lining the walls of the abdominal cavity, AKA the parietal peritoneum. The, the parietal peritoneum that lines the anterior and posterior abdominal walls, it drapes itself over the pelvic viscera and invests them in part with a serous coat. Uh, coat. Uh, hence, uh, there's a kind of division between the abdominal cavity and the pelvic cavity, though, as I mentioned earlier, it's not exactly a muscular diaphragm in the anatomical sense. And as a reminder, the pelvic viscera are located below and outside the peritoneal, peritoneal cavity. Um, the diagram on the left shows the mid-sagittal section of the male, the male's uh, pelvic cavity. From anterior to posterior, we have the, uh, the, the pubic symphysis, uh, we have the bladder, we have the rectum, and then we have the, the bit of the sacrum bone. Uh, the parietal peritoneum, it lines the anterior abdominal wall. And at the top of the pubic symphysis, the parietal peritoneum reflects off of the anterior wall over the top of the bladder to which it is intimately uh, adherent and attached to. The parietal peritoneum then dips down into the posterior wall of the bladder before reflecting upward into the anterior aspect of the rectum and then back up onto the posterior abdominal wall. Hence the parietal peritoneum, it creates a pouch uh, between the bladder and the rectum known as the rectal vesicle pouch. The rectal vesicle pouch is the most dependent part of the peritoneal cavity. And if a male were to have free fluid within this peritoneal cavity in the upright position, the fluid would actually collect into this rectal vesicle pouch. And on the right is the mid sagittal aspect for a female. And from anterior to posterior, similarly, we have the pubic symphysis. We have a bit of the bladder as well. But now that we, uh, we also have the, uh, the uterus to think about, um, as well as the uh, rectum and sacrum. Within the female, the parietal peritoneum, it lines the anterior abdominal wall. And at the pubic symphysis, 
the parietal peritoneum reflects off of the anterior abdominal wall and over the top of the bladder, uh, to which it is also densely adherent. The parietal peritoneum, it then goes up and onto the anterior aspect of the uterus. Uh, and then actually onto the posterior superior part of uh, the vagina proper before reflecting up and onto the anterior aspect of the rectum per se. Uh, and then back up onto the posterior wall of the abdomen. Within female, the parietal peritoneum, unlike forming one pouch in the male, it forms two dependent pouches uh, within the female. The vesical uterine pouch located between the bladder in front, with the bladder in front and the uterus behind. Um, and then the other pouch is the recto uterine pouch or the pouch of Douglas. In the upright position, if a female were to have free fluid in the peritoneal cavity, perhaps due to say a rupture uh, appendix or a ruptured ovarian cyst, the fluid will accumulate in the rectal uterine pouch. And the pouch of Douglas directly relates to the posterior wall of the vagina. Hence, free fluid, if it were to be in the actual pouch of Douglas, can actually be palpated in a digital vaginal examination, which you'll probably learn um, it further deep in your clinical years. If you were to insert two glove fingers into, vagina, into the vagina, uh, the tip of the fingers will be directly related to the pouch of Douglas. And with the tip of your fingers, you can actually feel whether or not there is free fluid there or not. Normally, the uterus will be antiverted and antiflexed. You may have come across that anatomical positional terms before. Antiversion means that the long axis of the uterus is bent forward on the long axis of the vagina against the urinary bladder. And antiflexion indicates that the long axis of the body of the uterus is bent forward on the long axis of the cervix. Now let's move on to uh, the ureter. Uh, recall that the ureter descends on the, the psoas muscle along tips of lumbar transverse processes, crosses over the pelvic rim over the common iliac inner artery and vein, runs along the side wall of the pelvis and plugs into the bladder from behind. As the ureter passes from the sidewall of the pelvis towards the posterior aspect of the bladder, the ureter is crossed by an important structure, the, uh, the vas deferens in male and the uterine artery in females. So in the case of a hysterectomy, when a surgeon is removing the uterus, the surgeon needs to tie up the blood supply through the uterine artery. And the surgeon needs to be very careful not to tie off the ureter uh, in the same position. Uh, sorry, in the same ligature, so to speak. So let's talk a little bit about the bladder. Um, so the bladder is shaped like a triangular pyramid with the apex facing anteriorly towards the pubic bone. The base of, the of this pyramid is known as the trigone and faces to the back posteriorly. It has a superior surface that expands and pushes uh, superiorly against the abdominal cavity as the bladder, bladder itself fills with uh, urine. And the inferior surface is kind of cradled in you know, the hammock-like pelvic floor, so to speak. So in the image on the left, we see that the anterior apex has been uh, removed so now we're looking at the posterior base of the bladder from a anterior view. The ureters enter from the superior tips of the trigone, and then the urethra exits from the inferior tip of the trigone. The trigone itself is smooth if you were to somehow palpate it. And at the trigone, the mucosa is intimate, is densely and intimately adherent to the muscular wall of the bladder. In other regions, the mucosa is not as adherent to the muscular wall, and it becomes these various folds, as you can see here. The midline pelvic viscera needs to be kept nicely in place. So as the midline pelvic viscera um, fills up with uh, you know, urine, 
it cannot be you cannot have it uh, drop out of the pelvis. Therefore, all of the midline viscera have important cut guide ropes that connect them to the side wall of the pelvis. However, one cannot stabilize the expanding parts uh, of the midline viscera, or else it will prevent those parts from properly expanding as it fills with urine. Each of the midline viscera, however, has a non-expensile part, i.e. it doesn't stretch that much. It is the non-expensile parts of the midline viscera that are stabilized. In the case of the bladder, this would be the, blad the, the bladder neck. Uh, and the main stabilizer of this bladder neck is actually the pubovesical ligament, which runs from the pubic bone around the neck of the, of the bladder and then back to the pubic bone. In males, the pubic ves vesicle ligament is also sometimes referred to as the pubo-prostatic ligament because it runs from the pubic bone around the neck of both the bladder and the prostate and then back around the pubic bone, kind of like a boomerang of sorts. So these are some kind of questions to kind of jug people's thinking. Um, and uh, so just for the sake of time, uh, I will describe some of these answers. So for one, uh, you have the pelvic brim, uh, then you have the pectineal line, then you have the arcuate line, and then you have the margin of the sacral isla, and then the sacral promontory from anterior to posterior. The plane of least dimensions uh, extends from S4 vertebra posteriorly through the ischial spine, and then to the base to, of the pubic bone anterior. It's like that imaginary plane. The main sacroiliac ligaments are the anterior, posterior, and interosseous sacroiliac ligaments. The accessory ligaments that support these main sacroiliac ligaments are the iliolumbar ligament, the sacrotuberous ligament, and the sacrospinous ligament. Um, the three muscles that are associated with the bony structures of the pelvis are the obturator internus, the piriformis, the levator ani, and the levator ani itself is a combination of the pubococcygeus, iliococcygeus, and the actual coccygeus itself to some degree. Uh, the one dependent pouch formed by the peritoneum of the, of the parietal peritoneum is the uh, rectal vesicle pouch. Um, and in females, they also have a rectal vesicle pouch, but they also have the vesicle uterine pouch. Uh, but the rectal uterine pouch is also known as the pouch of Douglas. Uh, the structure that crosses the ureter in males in the posterior aspect is the vas deferens, and in females, uh, it's the uterine artery, and this is something to keep in mind when surgeons do a hysterectomy. Um, the main stabilizer of the bladder in females is the pubo-prostatic ligament, and in females is the pubo-vesical ligament. So now let's talk about the, the male reproductive system. It consists of a series of ducts and tubules with components in the abdomen, pelvis, and per perineum. Components of the male reproductive system are linked with the urinary tract, which reflects their embryological, embryological origin similarities. The components of the male reproductive system can be divided into bilateral structures, midline structures, and accessory glands, um, which will be on the following slide, as listed here. And let's go through them and their relevant pathologies. So talking about the testes, it, it, uh, or the singular testis, uh, it develops high on the posterior abdominal wall and descends through the inguinal canal in the anterior abdominal wall. And it, it ends up in the scrotum because the scrotum provides a cooler environment that favors spermatogenesis, i.e. temperatures below um, uh, 37 uh, degrees Celsius, at least according to the textbook. Now, would anyone, does anyone know uh, why would it be a concern if the, if the testis fails to descend? Or what would that kind of predispose the male to if it doesn't descend? All right, so um, the actual term for this is known as cryptorchidism, failure of either one or both testes to ascend into the scrotum. Uh, 
occurring in one to three percent of male newborns. Uh, and if left alone, uh, eight percent of them would actually spontaneously resolve itself. Um, but the problem, if it remains ascended or remains superiorly, is that it predisposes to the risk of testicular cancer in addition to some issues with male infertility as well. So moving on, the testis carries with it various nerves, vessels, lymphatics, and a duct during its descent. And all of these form the spermatic cord uh, after acquiring three layers of covering. Because the testis drags this spermatic cord neurovascular bundle with it, the lymph uh, vessel goes back into the origin of the testis. So now let's go back to testicular tumor. So if you were to have a testicular tumor, particularly in those who have cryptor cryptorchidism earlier, the lymph nodes uh, that was briefly mentioned earlier, uh, the, specifically the paraaortic lymph nodes would be enlarged and could be detected on palpation. So here we have the cross section of the testis is a tough outer fibrous capsule known as the tunica albuginea in blue, uh, which encloses a massive coiled seminiferous tubules, about 250, 300 compartments of these tubules. And it is within these tubules that sperm is produced. So on the right is the actual cross section of the tubules themselves. It has two types of cells, the actual Spermatogonia, which throughout later stages of meiosis will become the sperm proper, and then the Sertoli cells in purple, which are like the support cells of the sperm. The developing spermatocytes, they stack in columns from the outer edge of these tubules into uh, towards the lumen. And between each column, it is a single Sertoli cell that extends from the outer edge of the seminiferous tubule to the lumen. Surrounding the outside of the tubule is a basal lamina that acts as a barrier, preventing certain large molecules in the interstitial fluid from entering the seminiferous tubule, but allowing the testosterone to enter easily. The function of the Sertoli cells, as I mentioned earlier, is to support and regulate sperm development. The Sertoli cells manufacture and secrete proteins um, such as inhibin and activin, which are like uh, uh, inhibiting and promoting growth factors, respectively. Other enzymes and also androgen binding protein or ABP. ABP itself is secreted into the lumen of the seminiferous tubule. From there, it binds to testosterone, as its name implies. The testosterone bound to protein is less lipophilic and therefore it cannot diffuse out of the lumen of the seminiferous tubule. The Leydig cells located within the interstitial space or the interstitial between the seminiferous tubules itself, so these blue butt lip bits between the tubules, um, secrete testosterone. And they first become active in the developing fetus when the testosterone is needed to direct development of initial male sexu sexual characteristics. Afterwards, these Leydig cells, they become inactive for a time, but once puberty hits, the Leydig cells, they resume their production of testosterone. And it is also, these cells are also necessary to, uh, to produce the enzymes, the aromatase, uh, uh, to convert testosterone to estradiol as well. Uh, the spermatogonia, the germ cells that undergo meiotic division to become sperm, are found clustered near the basal ends of the Sertoli cells. Spermatogonia, they undergo mitosis themselves to create additional sperm cells. Afterwards, some of them, they start meiosis to become primary spermatocytes. And as spermatocytes, they differentiate and grow up to be sperm, move more inward towards the lumen of the seminiferous tubules, uh, con which, as I mentioned earlier, is continuously surrounded by Sertoli cells. By the time the spermatocytes reach the luminal end of the Sertoli cells, they have undergone two meiotic divisions already to become the spermatids. The spermatids remain embedded in the apical membrane of the Sertoli cells while they complete the transformation into sperm, losing most of its cytoplasm and developing a flagellated tail to help them with motility uh, uh, which in turn will help them to fertilize the egg cells within 
uh, you know, the female reproductive tract. The chromatin of the nucleus condenses into a dense structure that fills the majority of the sperm head, while a lysosome-like vesicle called the acrosome flattens out to form the cap over the tip of the nucleus. The acrosome itself contains the enzymes necessary to promote and facilitate fertilization when the sperm contacts the egg. The mito there's also mitochondria within the sperm now to produce energy for that, uh, that motility to ensure sperm motility, um, specifically within the midpiece of the sperm body and also within the microtubules that form the sperm tail. The sperm will then be released into the lumen of the seminiferous tubule, but they are not yet mature and not yet able to swim just yet. They are pushed out of the lumen by other sperm uh, and by bulk flow of the fluid secreted by Sertoli cells. The sperm travels through the seminiferous tubules through the straight tubule and into the weak testis, located in the hilum of the testis called the mediastinum testis, and then via efferent ductules into the head of the epididymis. The epididymis stores the sperm onto ejaculation. The sperm entering the epididymis, they complete maturation during their 12 days of transit time from the Sertoli cells into the epididymis. Um, uh, and aided by protein secretion of the epididymal cells. The epididymis is one single long coil duct situated on the posterior lateral aspect of the testis. Its head relates to the posterior pole of the testis and its tail is related to the inferior pole of the testis and is also connected to the vas deferens, aka ductus deferens. Because the testis itself starts its life with an extra peritoneal fat with its back to the parietal peritoneum. When the testis descends or starts its descends down the posterior abdominal wall around the anterior abdominal wall through the inguinal canal, it carries with it an extension of the peritoneal cavity, specifically the processus vaginalis. Usually this uh, processus vaginalis, it closes off and becomes sort of like a remnant vestigial fibrous core. Uh, sometimes this processus vaginalis also remains in communication with the peritoneal cavity, which would predispose them to an indirect inguinal hernia. Uh, normally, though, the processus vaginalis does not close off immediately surrounding the testis and is retained in the tunica vaginalis, which is the peritoneal coating on the testis. Hence, the tunica albuginea surrounds the seminiferous tubules and the interstitial tissue around the seminiferous tubules. And as I said earlier, the tunica vaginalis surrounds the tunica abuginia. So uh, we'll just quickly go through these questions together. So epididymitis, as the name implies, would be inflammation of the epididymis, the, the storage of you know, the sperm prior to ejaculation. Acute onset of epididymitis would present as the gradual uh, sorry, a uh, gradual onset of posterior scrotal pain and swelling over one to two days. There may also be fever, uh, hematuria, dysuria, urinary frequency, and the pain may radiate into the inferior aspect of the abdomen. Uh, the positive sign for epididymitis is pran sign, where uh, if you were to elevate the scrotum, it would relieve this kind of pain. If this uh, epididymitis uh, is left to, uh, uh, so epididymorchitis is when uh, epididymitis, if left alone, if the inflammation is left alone and left to spread to the testis, it now involves inflammation of the testis as well, hence orchitis. Uh, the most common cause is epididymorchitis. Uh, in sexually active young men are chlamydia, trachomitis, and Neisseria gonorrhea. Uh, and the most common causes of epididymal orchitis in elderly men is usually because of recurrent urinary tract infections uh, and benign prostatic hyperplasia. And the most common bugs in this case would be E. coli and pseudomonas. Because remember, in older men, it is due to enteric bacteria are transported by urine reflux into the ejaculatory duct secondary to bladder outlet obstruction. So now let's talk about the seminal vesicles and bulbo urethral gland. 
So going back to the vas deferens, it goes up into the scrotum uh, up through the anterior abdominal wall via the inguinal canal, alongside along the side wall of the pelvis, and then heading back to the posterior aspect of the bladder. In males, the vas deferens uh, becomes, uh, sorry, it crosses the ureter, as mentioned earlier, with regards to that anatomy. And remember, in females, it is the uterine artery that crosses the ureter. The vas deferens opens via an ejaculatory duct into the prostate gland. This duct is the common duct for the vas deferens and seminal vesicle to see them kind of heading into the prostate gland. Uh, the testis, uh, epididymis, and vas deferens are responsible for the formation, storage, and passage of sperm altogether. So let's talk about the three accessory glands of the male reproductive system. The prostate gland, the bulbal urethral glands, and the, uh, 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 sorry, three meaning seminal vesicles, prostate gland, and bulbal urethral glands. The primary function of this three accessory glands is to secrete various fluid mixtures, uh, which is that ejaculatory mixture, which helps to provide nutrient as well as facilitate an environment to protect the sperm uh, following ejaculation as the, as the uh, semen uh, enters the female reproductive tract. So when sperm leaves the vas deferens during ejaculation, they are joined by these secretions by those accessory glands mentioned earlier, resulting in semen. 99% of that semen is at, 99% uh, of that semen's volume is provided by those accessory glands. Um, the seminal vesicles is situated to the superior lateral aspect uh, of the prostate gland lateral to the vas deferens. It contributes prostaglandins that help to promote sperm motility and, and transport to both male and female reproductive tracts. The seminal vesicles, as I said earlier, helps to provide nutrients for sperm metabolism specifically in the form of fructose and vitamin C, in addition to enzymes to, uh, to clot the semen in the vagina and then liquefy that clot later on. So seminal vesicle, as I mentioned, joins with the vas deferens all together to form the ejaculatory duct, which opens into the prostatic urethra here at the seminal colliculus uh, or verumontanum, a verumontanum the midline ridge in the middle of that prostatic urethra. The Cowper's gland or bulbal urethral glands is associated with the urogenital uh, diaphragm, uh, which itself is part of the perineum. And it's shaped and resembles the size of a pea. The bulbal urethral glands themselves contribute mucus for lubrication, as well as buffers to neutralize some of the acidic environments of the vagina. And the bulbal urethral glands opens into the penile part of the urethra. Continuing on with the male reproductive system, with let's talk about the chestnut-sized prostate gland. The prostate gland is situated between the neck of the bladder above in the pelvic floor and urogenital diaphragm below. The prostate gland contributes buffers in order to neutralize the acidic environment of the vagina, and it provides nutrients for sperm metabolism, as mentioned before, as well as enzymes to initially clot the semen in the vagina and then liquefy the clot later on. The prostatic ducts open into the prostatic urethra at the urethral sinuses on either side of the seminal colliculus. The prostate gland would be palpable on a DRE, a digital rectal examination. If you were to pass two blood fingers up a male rectum, the front of the fingers will be uh, touching against the prostate gland. And there you can feel the size of the prostate, consistency, and the shape of the prostate, which are all important steps in assessing and grading uh, a, a, a prostate in the suspicions of a benign prostatic hyperplasia or prostate cancer, uh, which are the two main pathologies associated with the prostate gland. Uh, 
So benign prostatic hyperplasia or hypertrophy, um, it was formerly used for this condition, but, uh, uh, but since there's actually an increase in the number of epithelial and stromal cells um, uh, in the periurethral peri area of the prostate, not an enlarger in the cells, um, that's why we use hyperplasia, sorry, that's why we use hyperplasia now as opposed to hypertrophy. Um, and contrary to what people think, benign prostatic hyperplasia does not mean pre-cancer or pre-malignancy. So notice that because of its intimate anatomical uh, approximation to the male uh, urinary system, uh, uh, the male, yeah, urinary system, uh, specifically between the bladder neck and the pelvic floor, um, if it were to be enlarged, it would lead to that uh, sort of urinary, uh, that obstruction to urinary outflow. So re let's remind ourselves that the prostate gland, it contributes to the neutralization of the acidic environment within the vagina, supplies the sperm with nutrients in the form of citric acid and uh, fructose, and as well as the necessary enzymes for semen clotting and later uh, li uh, li li liquefying. So, Obstructive urinary symptoms in the context of BPH and prostate cancer. Um, specifically, the patients may say that they have difficulty straining, uh, with difficulties with straining or initiating that uh, urinary, urinary stream. Also difficulties to stop the urinary stream. And if there were to be a stream, there would be, it would be weak with some dribbling at the end. And also they would feel like they haven't really emptied their bladders completely. Um, there will also be storage irritative symptoms such as urgency, frequency, and nocturia. And obviously with cancers, you gotta think about the constitutional symptoms such as weight loss, loss of appetite, uh, night sweats. Uh, so just as a reminder, BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia is the enlargement of the periurethral lobes or the lateral and, and middle lobes uh, um, sort of around the prostate, uh, sorry, of the prostate, which compress the actual prostatic urethra itself um, into a narrow vertical slit. Um, you may say that uh, the benign prostatic hyperplasia is the enlargement of the histological transition zone. Um, and this is also something to help distinguish between uh, BPH versus prostate cancer because um, BPH occurs within the transition zone, whereas prostate cancer arises from the uh, peripheral zone or the posterior aspect um, of the uh, posterior lobe of the uh, prostate, the outermost part of the prostate. Sorry, Alex, could you just repeat that last bit that you said the difference of where they come from? Yeah, so with benign prostatic hyperplasia is in the more centralized uh, transition zone and uh, prostate cancer is on the more um, external posterior aspect of the prostate. Okay, um, awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, no worries. And now let's talk about the uterus. Sorry. <clears throat> so the uterus when females is a hollow muscular organ about eight by five by three centimeters. Uh, and the size of the pregnancy depends on, sorry, the size of the uterus actually can depend on how many pregnancies the uterus has carried. Um, so if a uterus has carried a pregnancy, it will never uh, ovulate back down to a normal size, I guess, prior to uh, carrying a fetus. And remember that the, in most women, the uterus is both antiverted and anti-flex. Uh, the uterus is roughly triangular in shape. Um, and the upper end of the uterine cavity receives a fallopian tube on either side. Part of the uterus above the entry point of the fallopian tube is known as the fundus of the uterus. Uh, 
And if you go inferiorly, this is the body of the uterus. The body of the uterus tapes down to the isthmus, which is then continuous with the, uh, the actual cervix itself. Uh, the cervix itself is two to three centimeters in length and extends from the internal uterine os to the external uterine os. The cervix is a strong pivot point, pivotal point for the uterus um, because remember, the uterus has to expand massively during pregnancy. And hence, it is the cervix that is uh, stabilized. And the uterus itself consists of three layers, the parametrium, the myometrium, uh, which is more muscular, smooth muscular, and the endometrium. And so therefore you may have uh, came up with the term endometriosis in your studies. And endometriosis, what this means is it is defined as the presence of endometrium, endometrial tissue outside of this cavity. Uh, it can be found pretty much anywhere in the reproductive tract, but it's most commonly found within uh, the ovary, most commonly the pelvis and the peritoneum. If we were to look inside the ovary, uh, uh, there is, uh, it can appear as something called as a endometrioma or blood filled chocolate cyst, um, if you want to use layman's terms. And endometriosis may be due to retrograde uh, flow, metaplastic transformation of multipotent cells, or transportation of endometrial tissue via the lymph system. So now we are looking at the uterus from the posterior aspect. So recall that the parietal peritoneum, it lines the anterior abdomen and it reflects off of that abdomen wall at the top of the pubic symphysis over the top of the bladder. It goes up into the anterior aspect of the uterus, over the top of the uterus, all the way down the posterior aspect of the uterus onto the posterior superior part of the vagina, reflecting up onto the anterior aspect of the rectum and then back up on the posterior abdominal wall. The parietal peritoneum covering the top and back of the uterus extends laterally towards the pelvic walls on either side, sort of like the greater and lesser omenta within the abdominal cavity superior. The double fold of the peritoneum extending off each of the lateral aspects of the uterus towards the side walls of the pelvis is known as the broad ligament. And although the broad ligament is called the broad ligament, it's actually a, as mentioned earlier, a double fold of peritoneum as opposed to a fascial condensation. And therefore it doesn't really help to stabilize the uterus, or at least it's not one of its main stabilizers. The fallopian tube is itself 10 to 14 centimeters in length, lies in the upper part of this broad ligament here, this, this Batman-shaped ligament here. Um, if you were a uterus, the head would be, your head would be the fundus, and your legs would stretch out into the vagina, your arms would spread out to be the fallopian tubes, and your fingers would be the, the fimbria. It's just some uh, sort of really um, uh, disturbed variation of the Vitruvian person, if you will. If someone now draped the per parietal peritoneum over you, the parietal peritoneum would cover your entire head and your entire back, and your arms would serve as curtain rods with parietal peritoneum draping down in front uh, and behind. So now let's talk about some of the uh, specific structures. Uh, so the proximal one centimeter of the fallopian tube is embedded in the intramural part, is, is embedded in the uterine wall. And this is the intramural part of the fallopian tube, which literally means within the wall. As you move along the fallopian tube away from the uterus, it becomes wider and wider so that the diameter increases and increases. And adjacent to the uterus is the isthmus, which is a straight, uh, which is a straight and narrow aspect. Uh, and this isthmus layer becomes the ampulla, uh, 
So the isthmus, the most kind of direct part, narrow and straight, widens to become the, amp the, uh, the ampulla, which in turn widens to become the infundibulum. Uh, and the infundibulum forms the fib finger-like fimbria at the very end. The fimbriae themselves wrap around the ovary uh, at the time of ovulation to kind of scoop up the egg, uh, which in turn will be inserted through the fallopian tubes uh, deeper into the female reproductive tract. And the ovary is situated actually on the posterior aspect of this broad ligament and is attached to the upper pole of the uterus by the proper ovarian ligament. The ovary is attached to the sidewall of the pelvis by the suspensory ligament of the ovary. And the proper ovarian ligament is not a fascial condensation, but is a remnant of the gubernaculum. If you are a uterus, then the ovaries would be behind you. And from the ovaries, there would be a ligament going to your shoulders, which is the proper ovarian ligament, a ligament coming forwards, which is the round ligament. The round ligament travels forwards through the deep inguinal ring, through the inguinal canal, through the superficial inguinal ring, and blends with superficial tissues of the labia. The proper ovarian ligament, which connects the ovary to the shoulder, is continuous with the round ligament, which connects the ovary to the labia. Together, the proper ovarian ligament and the round ligament are remnants of the gubernaculum in females. And the gubernaculum is like a kind of like a fetal development structure, uh, in case you're wondering. The suspensory ligament of the ovary, which tethers the ovary to the sidewall of the pelvis, is a fascial condensation around the ovarian artery, which is one of the paired branches coming off the side of the abdominal aorta. Recall that the paired branches coming off the side of the abdominal aorta are the adrenal arteries, the renal arteries, uh, and the gonadal arteries. So let's talk about the ovary and the egg cycle in a bit more detail. So the ovary is an elliptical two to four centimeter uh, organ. It has an outer connective tissue uh, and an inner connective tissue. Uh, the inner tissue is the stroma. Most of the ovary consists of a thick outer cortex filled with ovarian follicles at various stages of development or uh, decline after menstruation. The small central medulla contains nerves and vessels. Uh, like the testis, the ovary produces both gametes and hormones. About 7 million oogonia in the embryonic ovary develop into uh, eventually half a million primary oocytes. Um, so each primary oocyte is enclosed in a primary follicle with a single layer of granulosa cells separated by a basement membrane from an outer layer of cells called the, uh, the thecal cells. Females produce gametes in monthly cycles. So the 28 day period range between 21 to 35, the menstrual cycles. Uh, and they are marked, the menstrual cycles are marked by an average of a four to five day period of bloody uterine discharge or menses. Um, the menstrual cycle can be described uh, in a couple of ways by, the by following the changes that occur in the follicles of the ovaries or the ovarian cycle, or by following the changes within the endometrium uh, or the uterine cycle. So the ovarian cycle can be divided into three phases. The follicular phase, uh, the period of follicular growth in the ovary is the most variable in length. It can last between uh, 10 days to three weeks, depending on the person. The ovulation phase marked by shortly after this surge in the luteal hormone, where at ovulation one or more once one or more follicles they have ripened, the ovary would release the oocytes during ovulation. Uh, and then in the latter half luteal phase, uh, uh, which is, uh, gets its name from the transformation of a ruptured follicle into the corpus luteum and named for its yellow pigment and lipid deposits. The corpus luteum secretes hormones that continue the preparation for pregnancy. And if pregnancy does not occur, the corpus luteum stops the function after two weeks and the ovarian cycle begins again. And obviously if it does occur, um, it would become 
if fertilization pregnancy does occur, it will become the, uh, the placenta eventually. Now talking about the uterine cycle, let's talk about it uh, into its own three phases. So, so menses, the beginning of the follicular phase and ovary corresponding to the menstrual bleeding from the uterus as it sheds off that layer from the prior cycle. The proliferative phase where um, it's the latter part of the ovaries follicular phase where the endometrium kind of begins to build itself up again in preparation for a potential pregnancy and the latter half, the secretory phase, where after ovulation, hormones from the corpus luteum convert the thickened endometrium into a secondary structure. This means that luteal phase of the ovarian cycle corresponds with the secretory phase of the uterine cycle. And as mentioned before, if no pregnancy occurs, the superficial layers of the secretory endometrium are lost during menstruation as the uterine cycle commences once again. The ovarian and uterine cycles are under control of various hormones. So from the uh, hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, you have GnRH from the hypothalamus, FSH, LH from the anterior pituitary, uh, estrogen, progesterone, and inhibin from the ovary. Within the early follicular phase, the first day of menstruation, uh, this point uh, which is day one of the cycle. And this point was chosen to start the cycle because the bleeding of the menstruation is an easily observed physical sign. Just before the beginning of each cycle, the, the various hormones, FSH and LH secretion from the anterior pituitary, it increases. FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, induces the maturation of various follicles in the ovaries. And as the follicles grow, Follicle stimulating hormone acts on the granulosa cells in the follicle to stimulate productions of estrogens and AMH. And luteinizing hormones acts on fecal cells to produce, to stimulate production of the androgens into uh, neighboring granulosa cells, where they have the aromatase enzymes to convert them into estrogen proper. Uh, the AMH hormone decreases follicle sensitivity to FSH, which uh, prevents recruitment of additional primary follicles once one group has started developing. So it's its own inherent kind of negative feedback procedure, so to speak. Within a clinical setting, the blood AMH levels can be used as an indicator of how many follicles are developing uh, early in a cycle. It can also be helped to diagnose polycystic ovarian syndrome, or PCOS, in which various ovarian follicles deform fluid-filled cysts. Um, Gradually increasing estrogen levels within the body has various effects. Um, the estrogen is exerts a negative feedback on the follicle stimulating hormone production, and as well as the luteinizing hormone production from the anterior pituitary, which in turn stops the development of additional follicles to occur simultaneously within the cycle, i.e. only one follicle per cycle. So, uh, Additionally, the estrogen acts on uh, granulosa cells to add to keep that estrogen production going on. So this is one of the rare instances of positive feedback in the human body, because you want to have that uh, estrogen production, even though you tone down FSH and luteinizing hormone. Within the uterus, menstruation ends during the early follicular phase. Uh, and under the influence of estrogen from a developing follicle, the endometrium begins to grow and proliferate. Characterized by an increase in the number of cells, as well as this increase in blood supply uh, to bring the nutrients and oxygen to the thickening endometrium, because remember, preparing to get pregnant. The estrogen causes the mucus glands of the cervix to, cervix to also produce clear, watery mucus. Within the mid to late follicular phase, um, the follicles enlarge, granulosa cells begin to secrete fluid that collects into a central cavity known as the, eight, the antrum. And fluids in the antrum contains hormones and enzymes needed for ovulation. At each stage of follicular development, uh, some of the follicles, they undergo atresia or hormone-regulated cell death. And only a few follicles actually reach that final stage so if we talk about the various follicles in the ovary, only one of them per cycle reaches that final stage. 
And so now let's talk about the uh, rest of this step where uh, the end of the follicular phase. Um, so estrogen secretion from the granulosa cell reaches, an, reaches a high uh, and then granulosa cells under FSH secrete inhibin and progesterone. Inhibin, as the name suggests, prevents uh, FSH from being secreted further from the anterior pituitary. Uh, um, and estrogen, which initially provided a negative feedback on GnRH in the early follicular phase, now becomes a positive feedback to uh, leading to a pre-obligatory GnRH surge, which in turn leads to the luteal surge here. Uh, there's also a surge in the FSH, but not as much uh, because of the simultaneous uh, suppression by inhibin and the estrogen array present. The luteal surge is an essential part of ovulation uh, because it induces the resumption of meiosis with the developing follicle uh, with the first completion of the first meiotic division, converting the primary oocyte into a secondary oocyte as well as three other polar bodies. As this division is taking place, antro fluid collects and follicle grows to its greatest size, allowing it to release the egg. High levels of estrogen in the late follicular phase prepare the uterus for a possible pregnancy, and the endometrium grows to a thickness of three to four millimeters. Just before ovulation, the cervical glands produce copious amounts of thin, stingy, stringy mucus to facilitate sperm entry. And now we go into ovulation properly. So uh, almost uh, three quarters to a full day after the luteal surge, that's when ovulation occurs. The antral fluid spurts out along with the secondary oocyte, which itself is surrounded by two to three layers of kind of granulosa cells, like a, like a, uh, like a burrito of sorts. The egg is swept into the fallopian tube and then carried away to be fertilized or, you know, die if it doesn't get fertilized. Because remember, the egg lasts for about 12 to 24 hours after ovulation. In addition to promoting a follicular rupture, the luteal surge causes fecal cells to migrate into the antral space, mingling with the former granulosa cells and filling the cavity. Both cell types then transform into the luteal cells of the corpus luteum, or the process of luteinization. In the first half of the luteal phase following ovulation, the newly formed luteal cells, they accumulate lipid drops and glycogen granules in their cytoplasm as they prepare to secrete prostaglandins. Uh, estrogen synthesis reduces dramatically, but as the luteal phase progresses, uh, the corpus luteum produces steadily increasing amounts of progesterone and estrogen. So therefore, this structure here is now the cause for the increase in progesterone and estrogen. The estrogen levels, while increasing, they never peaked as high as earlier in the cycle. And the combination of estrogen and progesterone inserts negative feedback on the hypothalamus to prevent it from stop producing GnRH, as well as negative feedback on the uh, anterior pituitary to stop it from producing follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Uh, and the inhibin also adds on to that uh, already existing uh, negative feedback by the progesterone and the estrogen. FSH and luteinizing hormone secretion remains shut down throughout most of the remainder of the luteal phase. Under the influence of progesterone, the endometrium continues to uh, prepare for pregnancy and becomes a secreting structure. The endometrial glands coil, additional blood vessels grow into a connective tissue layer, and the endometrial cells deposit lipids and glycogen in their cyt cytoplasm. These deposits will provide nourishment for developing embryo while the placenta, the fetal maternal connecting tissue is developing. 
The progesterone is also responsible for the cervical mucus to thicken from that clear colors to now white, thicker mucus. And this mucus blocks the cervical opening, which prevents bacteria as well as sperm from entering the uterus following kind of fertilization. One interesting effect of progesterone is its ability to produce heat. Um, during the luteal phase of an ovulatory cycle, the woman's basal body temperature taken immediately upon waking up and before getting out of bed jumps up one degree Celsius above their body temperature and remains elevated until menstruation. Because this change in temperature set point occurs after ovulation, it cannot be used effectively predict to predict ovulation, but it's just whenever, it's just a general way to assess whether or not a patient, a woman is ovulating or, or not. Um, perhaps for couples that wish to, um, uh, you know, to engage in reproduction um, during that reproductive window. Within the late luteal phase or uh, menstruation, the corpus luteum, as I mentioned before, has an intrinsic lifespan of 12 days, uh, similar to the, uh, the secondary oocyte after ovulation. If pregnancy does not occur, the corpus luteum spontaneous undergoes apoptosis to become an inactive structure called the corpus albicans. And as the luteal cells degenerate, progesterone and estrogen production decrease. This fall, removes the negative feedback signal from the anterior and pituitary and hypothalamus. So FSH and LH um, increases um, once again. Maintenance of, second, of maintenance of the secretory endometrium depends on the presence of progesterone. When the corpus luteum uh, degenerates and hormone production decreases, blood vessels in the surface layer of the endometrium contract. Without oxygen and nutrients, surface cells die, and two days after corpus luteum ceases to function, or 14 days following ovulation, the endometrium sheds and sloughs off its surface layer, and that's how the, the menses occur. So these are just uh, uh, hormones described in detail. So another thing to keep in mind is that giving unopposed estrogen to women with an intact uterus would increase the risk of endometrial cancer by promoting the endometrial to grow and proliferate and replace itself excessively. However, if estrogen is provided together with progesterone, which is how uh, combined oral contraceptives work, that actually reduces endometrial cancer. So just a few things on prenatal testing. Screening tests are non-invasive and are offered to all pregnant women while diagnostic tests are invasive and are offered to women with increased risk of having a child with a birth defect. Non-invasive prenatal testing screening or NIPT involves conducting massively parallel sequencing on cell-free fetal DNA RNA in maternal blood. Although it is released as a screening test, some women terminate based on this result rather the diagnostic procedures listed on here, this slide here. So chorionic violet sampling and amniocentesis are the two primary diagnostic tests provided in Australia. Um, the samples will be examined using uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization or FISH tests, and then, confer and then confirmatory tests will be done by a chromosome uh, microarray or conventional karyotype assessing the chromosomes for things like trisomy 21 Down syndrome. So uh, recalling the cervix again, here's a better view of the ligament stabilizing the cervix. Uh, so remember the main stabilizing ligaments, the lateral cervical ligament, the uh, cardinal uh, ligament, or also known as the cardinal ligament, the uterosacral ligament, the rectal, uh, which is also known as rectal uterine ligament, the pubic cervical ligament, and 
So now quickly talking about fertilization, once an egg is released from the ruptured follicle, it is gathered up by the fimbriated opening of the fallopian tube. It's moved along the fallopian tube by the beating cilia. Meanwhile, sperm deposited into the vagina must go through the final maturation step known as capacitation, enabling the sperm to swim rapidly and fertilize the egg. The process apparently involves the reorganization of molecules in the outer membrane of the sperm head. And once the sperm has been capitated, it swims up the vagina through the uh, external os, the cervix, through the infundibulum of the uterus, uh, Uh, and then ultimately arriving in the ampulla of the fallopian tube. Of the 200 million sperm in a single e uh, ejaculated uh, bout of semen, only about 100 sperm reach this point at the ampulla of the, of the fallopian tube. And in the ampulla of the fallopian tube, the sperm contacts the egg. And the sperm can survive for up to five days in the female reproductive tract, uh, but the egg has a much shorter lifespan of only 24 hours. So that means that pregnancy can occur with sexual intercourse up to five days before ovulation, but only one day after. Uh, so remember, to fertilize the egg, the sperm has to penetrate uh, the uh, layers of the egg, the outer layer of granulosa cells known as the corona radiata, and a protective glycoprotein coat known as the zona pellucida, deeper to it. To get past these barriers, the capitated sperm, the release, um, to get past the capitated, uh, to get past these barriers of the egg cells, uh, the capitated sperm release powerful enzymes from the acrosome in the sperm head in a process known as uh, acrosomal reaction. The enzymes do dissolve these cell junctions and the zona pellucida allowing the sperm to wiggle their way toward the egg. The first sperm to reach the egg uh, quickly finds the sperm binding receptors on the membrane of the oocyte, therefore facilitating its fusion to the membrane of the egg. The fused section of the egg uh, opens up and the sperm nucleus sinks into the egg cytoplasm. Fusion of the egg sperm membrane signals the egg to resume and complete its secondary meiotic division. And this is, with this second and final meiotic division, this is how you get uh, the, the polar bodies to also form as well. 23 chromosomes from the sperm join 23 chromosomes of the egg, thus creating a zygote nucleus with a full set of genetic material. Meanwhile, fusion of the egg and sperm membranes also triggers a chemical reaction known as the cortical reaction. Um, within this reaction, the membrane-bound cortical granules and the peripheral cytoplasm of the egg release their contents into the space just external to the egg membrane. These chemicals rapidly change the membrane and surrounding zona pellucida so that additional sperm cannot penetrate or bind, i.e. only uh, the, the sperm that reaches the egg first is the only one that fertilizes the egg. This prevents polyspermy as mentioned just now. And fertilization typically occurs in the ampulla of the uterine tube 14 days after ovulation from a few minutes to five days after the sex. Uh, so now let's talk about implantation. So once the egg becomes fertilized, becomes the actual zygote, uh, it begins its own kind of division, its mitosis as the zygote makes its way from the fallopian tube to now implant itself into the uterine cavity. The dividing embryo takes about four to five days to move through the tube into the cavity. Under the influence of progesterone, smooth muscle of the fallopian tube relaxes, transporting uh, the egg slowly from the tube into the uterus. By the time the embryo reaches the uterus, it consists of a hollow ball of 100 cells, the blastocyst which consists of the outer layer trophoblast and an inner cell mass. Some of the trophoblasts will become the chorion, an extra embryonic membrane that will enclose the embryo and form the placenta. The inner cell mass of the blastocyst will develop into the embryo and to other extra embryonic membranes, including the amnion, which secretes amniotic fluid in which the embryo 
floats and the allantois, which becomes part of the umbilical cord that links the embryo to the mother. And the yolk sac, which de degenerates early in human development. Implantation of the blastocyst into the uterine wall normally takes a week after fertilization. The blastocyst secretes enzymes that allows it to invade the endometrium, uh, like a you know, parasite burrowing into its own host. As it does, the endometrium, uh, the cells of the endometrium, they would grow around the blastocyst until it completely circumscribes and engulfs. And going on a clinical tangent, um, which is ectopic pregnancy, if the woman had certain risk factors like a prior fallopian tubal surgery, cell pengitis in the context of pelvic inflammatory disease, um, scar tissue, um, this may get in the way of the zygote moving down the fallopian tube into the uterine cavity. And as a result, the, it causes it to implant at a other site than the uterine cavity. Most commonly, the ampulla of fallopian tube uh, where fertilization had initially occurred. You should suspect ectopic pregnancy in patients with a history of amenorrhea, lower than expected rise in human chorionic gonadotropin based on dates, and acute sudden onset of lower abdominal pain. This is ultimately confirmed with, uh, with a pelvic ultrasound. And an ectopic pregnancy presents with pain, with or without bleeding and often clinically mis and uh, with or without bleeding and can be mistaken for appendicitis in females. So just to quickly go through these questions, the three layers of the uterus are the parametrium, myometrium, and neometrium. Endometriosis is a painful disorder in which tissue similar to the tissue that normally lines the inside of the uterus grows outside of the uterus. And it most commonly involves ovaries, fallopian tubes, and the tissue lining the pelvis. Adenomyosis occurs when the tissue that normally lines the uterus, endometrial tissue, grows into the muscular wall of the uterus. The displaced tissue continues to act normally, thickening, breaking down, and bleeding during each of the menstrual cycles. So you have menses outside of where menses is supposed to occur. So the two ligaments are the ovarian ligament and the round ligament of the uterus, also known as the ligamentum teres uteri. The ovaries are retroperitoneal structures. Fertilization occurs typically in the ampulla of the fallopian tubes. Uh, implantation typically occurs within the endometrium of the uterus. Sperms can survive for up to five days in the female reproductive tract. And however, a released egg only survives between 12 to 24 hours after ovulation. And the fertile window for um, you know, the sex is between five days before ovulation to the day after ovulation. The acrosome reaction occurs after the capacitation of the sperm, which is essentially, which is essentially itself a reaction uh, induced by an influx of calcium. And it plays an essential role during fertilization by making the spermatozoa able of penetrating those two layers of the egg, uh, and then allowing the, uh, the sperm uh, nuclear material to fuse with the egg plasma material. Whereas the cortical reaction in happening later on prevents uh, the polyspermy and ensuring that only one egg gets fertilized by one sperm. Implantation takes place eight to nine days after conception, around six to 12 days after ovulation. Some risk factors for ectopic pregnancy include a previous ectopic pregnancy, fallopian tube surgery, uh, pelvic abdominal surgery, sexually transmitted infections, pelvic inflammatory disease, secondary or secondary to those infections or not, endometriosis, other factors such as cigarette smoking, age, history of infertility, and using reproductive technology such as in vitro fertilization. Most of the ectopic pregnancies will occur in the fallopian tubes, 95% in the ampullary, infundibular, or isthmus segments of the fallopian tubes. 5% of ectopic pregnancies occurs in the interstitium of the fallopian tubes, cervix, 
anterior lower uterine segment in the cesarean delivery scar ovary or peritoneal cavity. So that pretty much draws this lecture to a close. Um, if you got time and after receiving the actual lecture slides document, um, please fill out this survey as we are compiling um, opinions from junior doctors and medical students about their respective uh, medical education and all that good jazz um, to hopefully influence medical education in Australia, New Zealand, Tasmania, and relevant states and territories. And last but not least, uh, all the best for your end of year, um, all the best for your end of year assessments. Thank you ever so much for your patronage throughout the various lecture series of Teaching for Impact, as well as for supporting our initiatives to support the Asylum Seeker Resource Center. And may the conclusion of 2021 within and beyond end of year assessment preps um, bless you with moments of peace of mind, good fortune, personal success, um, uh, self-fulfillment, and an overall a stochastic end of the year. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. Have a good day.